So thank you very much, uh, uh, BPAP team, for like for, for this adventure. Um, we try and also we had a new uh, job portal uh, for actually a postdoc and uh, uh, researchers. Uh, so please uh, go to our platform and visit uh, different uh, sections in it. Um, so we would like to thank uh, the VSPA. Bakar Fellowship Program, uh, Berkeley Skydeck, and uh, Berkeley Research uh, for their help and actually uh, like uh, uh, helping uh, organize these uh, events and, uh, and programs. Um, so just uh, a reminder, we, 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 uh, we encourage uh, postdocs to, uh, to, to look at the Berkeley Science Fellows Program um, actually, uh, well, it provides a career transition opportunity for UC Berkeley postdocs. Uh, you can pair with uh, uh, ongoing startups and help them uh, uh, through your technical uh, expertise, and you can also learn a lot from them. Uh, I always say it's uh, like it's very, uh, it's a very interesting uh, adventure. Uh, so please visit the website. For the Science Fellows Program, this is a program where we're trying to pair postdocs with startup companies. If you don't know what startups do, if you want to get a feel for what they do. So we have 22 startups at Skydeck. They're looking for talent like yours. You can get a feel. It's just that internship program, like flexible time, four to five hours a week, where then you'll work on specific projects with the startup companies. If you're interested, please talk to us after the, after the event. But we'll be happy to you know, pair you up. There are more startups coming up next semester. Callan will talk about it, but you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah thank you, Narish. I was going to skip a lot of information there. Um, so, uh, yeah. And uh, well, just a reminder uh, on August 16, there was the uh, Lab to Market workshop today. We have the pre seed funding, fundraising, um, and uh, incubators and accelerators. And uh, the next one will take place on October 17th. You see, you see, actually, the like the subjects. It's working on collaborating with uh, university labs, and then basics of uh, starting a company. And uh, well, we'll we of course uh, update information on our website. So please uh, visit uh, the website, the uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter page, and uh, shoot us an email if you have any suggestions or questions. And uh, well, uh, last but not least. Uh, after the event, there is work, the networking hour. So, uh, yeah, it's an occasion to uh, know others and uh, know what they're doing, and also know about startups. Um, and finally, today we are actually very pleased to have uh, like uh, four successful women. It's a uh, it's it's a great opportunity uh, to learn from them from them, and um, and so we have uh, Iona Ayane. If I pronounce it right, <laughs> you wanna, yeah, you wanna on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, it's the entrepreneurship program manager at QB3, um, Gabriel uh, Leblanc. Gabriel Leblanc. <laughs> Gabriel Leblanc, <laughs> uh, uh, current professional and brand consultant uh, and writer with uh, 11 years of experience as an AI age program director, and uh, many other uh, like amazing, uh, amazing. Uh, uh, experience. We have also Brenna Tegler in charge of program operations at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Cyclotron Road. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we have Caroline Winnett, uh, who, uh, who is the executive director of the Berkeley uh, Skydeck and UC, UC Ber uh, Berkeley Startup Accelerator. So thank you very much. I'd um, like to upload them and uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Caroline. Um, Just put up the big, the big fat Skydex slide. Yes. <laughs> there it is. Um, voila. That's a pretty one. Yeah, Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll talk for five minutes or so. Sound? Okay. You guys can cut me off when sure. time to move on. Mm -hmm. um, oh, good idea. There we go. Yeah, I think my. How's that working? No, Not working? Yeah. 
us. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, or just um, I'll, I'll yell. Oh, we can sorry. hear you. Can you yeah. hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, just uh, hum or, or wave your hand if I just, my <clears> voice goes too low. Welcome, everybody. Uh, to the, for those of you who's first time at Skydeck, raise your hand. Okay. Welcome, and welcome to those uh, who've been here before. Uh, I'm the director here at Skydeck, and I thought I would go over a little bit about our program. Most of you are familiar with it, but I'll just blast through what we do here. Um, and then I'll talk particularly about uh, the funding program that we have. We have money uh, uh, to invest in startups, and then how we work with, with postdocs. So um, BPEP is actually housed within Skydeck administratively, which we're delighted to have them. Uh, post postdocs are full of talent and ideas. I mean, we are amazed over and over again how much startup talent is within the postdoc community. The last cohort, the last funded cohort we had, um, two of the startups were founded by postdocs. They're doing amazingly well. Um, we always have several startups here that are co-founded by postdocs. And, and as you're learning from each other, it's an incredibly rich array of talent and enthusiasm. So uh, what we do specifically here at Skydeck, let me give you a quick overview. Acceleration and incubation, um, real simple acceleration track. Every six months, we take about 20 companies, and they go through a formal acceleration program. They receive $100,000 in investment from our dedicated venture capital fund, or the Skydeck Fund and we present them at a formal demo day at the end of that process. We have an incubation track as well. Um, much larger group of companies, about 80. Those companies aren't formally accelerated. They don't receive that initial investment by the Berkeley Skydeck Fund, but the fund can elect to invest in those incubator track uh, startups when they raise their priced institutional rounds. Um, and those companies, a very large number, sometimes work out of the space, sometimes not. And they're everything from super early stage, um, a science project, and one of, one of your, your minds right now could be a hot desk company, that's the incubation track, we call them hot desk, uh, or it could be very late stage. For example, Line Bike, you've probably heard of Line Bike, um, the, the Line Scooters, they're a hot desk company in Skydeck. And one of the founders works out of here from time to time, even here today. <coughs> so we have these two floors in the Skydeck building, this top floor here, not too bad views, please. Please go walk around and check it out if you haven't seen it. And the third floor uh, in this building as well. And we just announced drop-in workspace in downtown San Francisco. Uh, so for our startups and founders who um, want to meet advisors or investors in San Francisco, they can now do that. And we'll be announcing some workspace on campus pretty soon. Um, we are a Berkeley program. We are administratively part of the Office of Research and report to Randy in his office. Uh, but we take all industries, everything from uh, consumer apps to hardcore biotech, gene therapy, robotics. You probably saw one of the robots scooting around earlier today. Uh, we take all industries. And our goal is to find, nurture, and accelerate startups that are either coming from Berkeley or coming to Berkeley. So we accept startups who are outside of the US. Uh, and then we just recently announced we're open to all UC founders. But first and foremost, we look for startups that are coming from Berkeley. So if there's a Berkeley founder on the application, we always take a first look at it. So how the funding works, um, as I mentioned, is companies that are accepted into the accelerator track receive that $100,000 in investment. Um, for those of you familiar with terms, uh, it's a $2 million cap safe note, which means we, we assess the startup being worth about $2 million uh, which is kind of a standard investment uh, term for an, a, an accelerator. So if you go to other accelerators in the Bay Area, you'll have kind of a similar type of investment. Of course, you won't be at Skydeck and get all this good work and stuff, but, um, but it's quite uh, up to market. And then, as I mentioned, for the incubator track companies, the hot desk companies, the Berkeley Skydeck Fund can <coughs> choose among those companies which ones they would like to invest in. On the roadmap is to uh, continue to raise funds, expand the cohort so that we can accelerate more than 20 companies every six months. We'd like to do uh, a much larger number. Uh, we're looking at interesting things like getting more investment for companies that need more investment, such as biotech companies. Um, our biotech 
track or by a track, we partner with QB3 uh, for that. And Luana is going to be diving into applications pretty soon. There's going to be hundreds that, <laughs> that are coming in. Um, we also partner with Cyclotron Road and all campus organizations. Um, we're very non-territorial and, and we very much feel that we represent Berkeley and not just in part of Berkeley. And then um, Naresh mentioned the Science Fellows Program. Super exciting program. We'll pair up postdocs with our startups here. And the goal is to find you really interesting startups that you would like to work with. Um, try it out, see what it's like to work with a startup. See if you like the, the energy, the environment. Um, see, if, see how that suits. And maybe you become a founder. Uh, maybe you just learn something that's really interesting to you. You get some, some development. Um, intellectually or professionally that's useful to you. All those outcomes are fantastic. And um, there's, that's up and running, so if you, if you haven't joined that, please uh, ask Naresh for more information. We're very much looking to have as many postdocs uh, as want to join to be matched up with the startup as possible. So um, that's Skydeck, that's how we work. Um, I'm gonna have to pop out at seven for, um, to run a webinar. But if you have questions, please feel free to ask, uh, either myself or Naresh, and we will get your questions answered. And hopefully we'll have lots more events here and lots of questions. All right. Questions? Yes, question. Quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you said you collaborate with all of Did you happen to collaborate with the C2M? Tech to Markets program from the Haas Business School, too? Sure, so yeah. Road and everyone else too. Yeah, we've had so not a formal collaboration, but um, but we definitely reach out to them. And um, we've had several startups that have come from that program to Skydive. Mm -hmm. Is that an area that you're interested in? I just heard them before. So okay, great. Just asking, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Anybody have a startup? Yes? Ah, okay. Question, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, funding biotech and other high tech, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if the that, that, that fund of, uh, applicable to regular consumer product if it's just you know a good idea, not like related to high tech. Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. We take all industries. Several of the companies in this current cohort are consumer products. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Applications are open currently. They're open for another week for the next cohort, which begins in January. So, so get your startup applications in. Um, and if you're not sure, if you're ready, that's fine. We also choose from this general application pool for the hot disk companies, which, as I mentioned, could simply be a very well-defined science project. Maybe I'll ask a question on behalf of everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had a, a nice startup last semester, cycle, uh, Supercarbon, mm -hmm. can you maybe walk them over about how we got molecular foundry into the loop and how we yeah. have all those resources in addition to money? You know. Great, great point. One of the coolest things about being part of Berkeley is the incredible access to the labs and facilities. So one of the startups that went through, um, in fact, several of them have taken advantage of the fact that if your startup is invested into by the Berkeley Skydive Fund and therefore UC Berkeley will benefit uh, from that fund. Did I mention the fund shares half the carry with campus? No. Oh, that's, I need to mention that. Um, it, that's actually our, our big end goal at, at Skydeck. We're working with startups and having a great time doing it. I'm a startup founder myself, so I absolutely love working with startups. But the real end game of this is that the Berkeley Skydeck Fund, it's all private venture capital money, invests in the startups here, and the start, that fund shares half of the management profits with campus. So as these startups grow up, they become uh, successful, they become acquired, they have an IPO, Berkeley receives funding from that. So we're really looking to set up a very serious and recurring <coughs> source of new revenue for campus. Um, so we're very excited about that. So getting back that to, to that point, um, if the Skydeck Fund has invested in a company, that company can use the molecular foundry facilities for a steep discount. And any resource on campus that a startup would need to connect to is, is something that we can typically facilitate and make it a whole lot easier for a startup to get to labs, um, fabs, talent, faculty, uh, the supercomputer up on campus, up, up at the lab, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, and if you all haven't heard of the SUFI program, um, that's an acronym for Shared User Facility something something. Uh, it's a beta program and it's trying to solve the problem of a professor or some researchers in a lab have a startup that wants to use that lab's facilities. As you can imagine, there's a tangled conflict of interest web to be, to be navigated and the university has a program to do that and they've just launched it. It's going well. Um, and if you are in that particular position, you can hear more about that. We've had several startups take advantage of that. Uh, it's a groundbreaking new program. Um, Berkeley really had to think creatively to get it done, um, but they did down at the Tech Transfer Office and did a great job. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Anything in particular that you're looking at the startup? Um, so in general, the, 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 the uh, recipe for a great startup is some combination of team, so who are the founders? Do they have the grit, the determination, and the expertise to take this to the finish line? Uh, the idea or the technology, what is it? Is it, is it a breakthrough? Is it a, a new type of technology? Is, is it a incredible idea whose time has come? And the third one is timing. Is the market ready? Is the market large? Is the market growing? Um, can that startup figure out how to get to market? So that's. The general recipe, um, and it, the stage can really vary. So we can take a startup that has no revenue. Obviously, for a biotech startup, a biotech startup at the seed stage that, that we fund will not have revenue or customers, uh, or even maybe even know who their customer is. Um, that's fine. If it's a consumer product, we're probably looking for some customers, probably looking for some revenue. Uh, but again, there's no. There's no formula to it. Um, it's an art form, and it, and it varies with each startup. Other questions? Do you have a deadline to revenue? As soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, How no. much does BPEP get invested in uh, your startup if you take the money? I'm sorry? How much does BPEP get invested in your company if, if, if you take money from Skydeck? Uh -huh. Does your company owe you anything? Does your startup owe you anything? Or is it just free money to start your company? Uh, so it's a, t it's a standard investment where the, the investor, which is the Berkeley Skydeck Fund, will have a piece of equity of your company, but they invest it. So now there's no other, give me some equity because you're a fair Skydeck, there's no other equity payment that is done. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. What has the demo day been like for the companies? What's the, been uh, the most successful company coming out of Skydeck so far? What's like the biggest raise or whatever? Uh, Line Bike, they've raised uh, half a billion dollars so far. We're, we're, yeah. um, they were a hottest company. They were quite advanced by the time they came. Uh, companies that came here at a very early stage and have progressed extremely quickly, probably the most visible example would be Kiwi. So the Kiwi robots that you've all seen going around campus, they came to Skydeck with a um, cool little Lego robot, you know, that was sort of wandering around, and now they have a fleet. Um, they raised a Series C round of uh, 1.5 million, I believe, and they are going to be raising an A round very soon. Civil Maps, 10 million dollars. Yes. Civil Maps came here, uh, four guys in a PowerPoint, and now their company's worth 100 million. That's the talent of Berkeley. Yes? How is the mentorship network of Skydeck? So mentorship is really our daily bread and butter. Um, that is the core of acceleration, is bringing people who know stuff to startups who need to know, know things. Uh, so how it works, we have a group of formal advisors. We call them Sky Advisors. You can see them all on our website. About 150. We have a broader network, our Skydeck network. We might end up calling it Skynet. I'm not sure we're so <laughs> that. Um, that's several hundred more, and these are people who have agreed to be on our list. If a startup needs an introduction or needs connection to someone in industry or an hour of advice, um, that's growing. And we have a full-time program director that spends pretty much all of her time connecting mentors and advisors to startups who need that. That's also uh, about half the time of what the fund does. There's two people who work at the Berkeley Skydeck Fund. 
Uh, and their job is to help these companies grow so they spend quite a bit of time uh, on mentorship. There's 500,000 living UC Berkeley alums. And when we call one of them and say, help the startup, because if they grow up and they are successful and they have a big exit, they, lots of money comes in, Berkeley gets some of that money, will you help them? The answer is almost always yes. So when we lead with that, that mission to support Berkeley, it's very powerful and we can bring a lot of people to help our startups. Even people who aren't Berkeley alums, who just believe in the mission of public education, are happy to help. Any classes that you have to attend, or is it just mentorship? Or how does that There's a formal series of workshops. Um, the first two weeks of the cohort are an intensive boot camp of workshops in various areas, plus mentor matching. Um, and then throughout the cohort, the six months, there's a number of programmatic elements, practice board and directors meetings, uh, meetings with the fund, coaching on various aspects of the startup. So yeah, there, there's, there's quite a bit of it. Thanks, Caroline. Please. Hi, everybody. My name is Brenna. I am at Psychoturn Road. Thanks. And my colleague, Beth, is also here in the audience. So if you want to learn more about Psychoturn Road, please approach either of us. So Psychoturn Road, based up at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, we are really differentiated by supporting those hard science technologies. Some people call them tough tech. And we are a fantastic deal because we give you, the founder, two years of salary, the, the uh, floor that is 80K for two years, plus you get travel money, you get health insurance, and you get $100,000 to work in the UC Berkeley ecosystem, and all of that is grant. We take zero equity. So part of the reason it is grant is because we take very early stage ideas. So it's very appropriate that we're here at the pre-seed stage discussion because we bring in people that maybe just have a crazy idea, maybe they have a patent, maybe they've published a few papers. But um, we like to say we choose awesome people and filter on technology. So we work with the Department of Energy's Advanced Manufacturing Office, we work with the Department of Defense, and we work with the state of California to support technologies in advanced manufacturing, in clean energy, and advanced electronics. And luckily, those three cover a lot of the world. Um, a lot of things when you get down to it can save energy, can improve electronics. Um, so that can still include bio companies. And so it's pretty broad. But if you're curious whether your technology fits in, please just come ask me afterward. And uh, we're a program that is a two-year cohort. We bring in a group of fellows each year everyone trying to do this hard technology startup. And um, we have mentorship centered around hard technology and we really build our network to support that. So it's a lot harder than trying to build an app because like, you don't just need a computer. Um, we structure the program so you have access to lab space, you have the hoods you need, and that's why we provide seed money to really get going in the lab. And so we help you get that initial grant funding and we help you decide where you should take your company. So a lot of people come in, they don't have a great sense of where their technology could go. They see they have a really cool new catalyst, or they have a new membrane or a new material. What do you do with that? So the program will really help you do that market research, get out there, talk to people. If you know the NSF i program, we encourage people to do that both in and before, to learn how to do that customer discovery. Beth over here has this excellent techonomics course which helps you learn how to assess the cost and what are those key pieces of your technology that you should tackle to really get the cost down so then someone out in the market will buy it from you. Um, and so we have built up a lot of this very specific educational training, educational networks. Um, every week we bring in someone who's doing a founder story or it's a lawyer talking about IP. And speaking of IP, um, speaking of that SUFI agreement, we also use that for people to access UC Berkeley, but we pre-negotiated a legal agreement for you to work at the lab and retain your IP rights. We don't want any entangled IP. <laughs> so um, that's a very important piece of the program. You retain your IP, 
and uh, people have been very successful. So we've graduated two cohorts of people. We're bringing in our fifth. We're opening up applications um, for the full month of October. So we have our registration page open now, psychotronroad.org slash apply. Um, and uh, people have typically raised venture capital money during that last six months of the program. So most people have exited with about two million. No one's had to stop what they're doing because they couldn't get money. Everyone's been able to find that path forward that works for them and feels like the funding they're getting really supports their business model. So the last thing I'll say, we've also, in part of this development of hard tech resources, we have something called Playbooks, which is playbooks at cyclotronroad.org, that has a lot of templates, a lot of legal um, explainers for when you're trying to get a hard technology company off the ground, and that includes a lot of um, videos that Beth has put together on this idea of techonomics and evaluating the market impact of your technology. So, I'll pause there. Can I maybe speak for your program too as well? Because sure. this program is unique because I don't think, I'm an entrepreneur so I understand how much time it actually takes to go from an idea stage to a proof of concept to actually go to the market. It's not like a mobile app, right? They, they can code something quite fast, but then you need some incubation. I think there's no other program like Cyclotron Road. Should definitely give it a shot if you're in the hard technology spaces. Yeah, should definitely talk, they're the best, uh, at least that I know of, in that space. Thanks, Ranesh. That's why we call ourselves an entrepreneurial research fellowship, not an incubator, not an accelerator, because it's grants and it's two years of serious support. Questions? Yeah. Options. Uh, do we have to have a PhD degree to get into the program? So it's a good question. We say PhD equivalent, and what that means is that, that you need to be the technical person that has the expertise to drive forward the the technology. We believe that technical people at this really early stage of the science are the right people to form companies. So you need to have the technical breadth to really be able to drive that and answer those tough questions in the science. Um, and then we need to be able to trust in the lab. So safety is of utmost um, importance. We're not going to be breathing down your neck or micromanaging you. We treat you like a postdoc or like a mini PI at the lab. Um, so that's what we mean by PhD equivalent. It's not required. We'll have a panel discussion after that, so if you have any questions, you can save that. But I want to introduce Beth uh, to talk about a technomics program. Yeah, I'll just say a little Yes, bit. a couple of, yeah, a couple the of minutes. Already doing yeah. um, so, so my role at, at Psychotron Road, or especially over the last um, year, has to been, one thing we've noticed that is a particular need among hard tech um, founders, and particularly at, at uh, early stage, um, innovators that are working in physics, biology, or chemistry, and particularly for people who are working on uh, innovations that can go into energy um, infrastructure, where you're looking at where your customer is not, you're not selling consumer products, but you're selling into industry, is the ability to do, and, and often these are commodity products, right, where it's a long road to, to market, but then there's a very large market opportunity at the end is being able to do the sort of the basic back of the envelope math around figuring out what your cost of production is or what the value proposition is of that innovation to industry. Um, and so I've developed this, uh, I've, I've taught this course now internally in Cycle John Road for two years, but I've condensed it all into just a series of sort of five minute videos and downloadable example spreadsheet models. Um, you can find that website on cyclotronroad.org slash techonomics. Um, but also, I'm interested in, in um, working with you guys to perhaps put on a workshop uh, sometimes in the future where we can actually sit down and um, work on your individual ideas and help you come up with those uh, very uh, simple. It's funny because you guys are, are awesome at math and science, but often it's like very basic arithmetic that you have to do it because it's not precise information. You guys are very uh, reluctant to, to make guesses about numbers, and so that's the main thing that, that we try to do is just to push you through to do those simple calculations to understand um, where you should be doing R&D to improve the cost or value. So, uh, thanks. Hi. My name 
name is Yana. Uh, it's like Iguana without the G. You can call me Iguana, my roommate calls me Iguana, so that's fine. Um, so I work at QB3, um, and a lot of people are confused about what QB3 is. So I'll start with the name. The QB3 um, stands for Quantitative Biosciences, three campuses, San Francisco, Berkeley, and Santa Cruz. So we have locations at each of these campuses, and we work with biosciences in all of its uh, glory. So we're looking at human health, um, we're looking at therapeutics, medical devices, diagnostics, and digital health. So those are the companies we work with. We try to help with everything but the money. So we are not profit, we don't have money, but what we do have is a lot of expertise. So over the last 20 years since we've been in existence, we've been helping uh, more than 600 startups. So what that means is that we've seen a lot of different cases, a lot of different pitch decks, a lot of different situations, uh, teams and needs and all sorts of stuff. So what we try to come up with is resources that people will need along the, the way. So I deal with a lot of startups even before they exist. So I call them day minus 30 or so. So it's usually a team, maybe there's a PI, um, a, a grad student, a postdoc. They'll come in and they'll say, you know, we have this project, it's really cool. This is where we're at. Either we have a patent or we don't have a patent. This is what we're thinking the, the product will look like and uh, we're ready to incorporate. And then we kind of go through the details of incorporation and what do you need um, to have uh, already in place and what can you do later. And we also discuss about what else is available for you. So you'll notice we actually have a lot of different partnerships, including with Skydeck. And that is because we believe that entrepreneurs need all the help they can get. So working with us is not exclusive of, uh, you know, so like we don't own you or anything. You guys can work with anyone and everyone. And that's why we do a lot of uh, cross uh, referrals. So if, if you come to us and um, it's not really a fire alley or we don't have one of the resources you need, but we know of another program that has that, well, we do a lot of um, referencing to another uh, resource. So I keep mentioning resources. What, what is that? Um, we have a, a startup in a box program that's usually the, the first time people interact with us. And what that is is um, incorporation assistance. So we work with law firms to incorporate the company for free. And that, you know, you can do it by yourself. There's all sorts of websites and forms and stuff like that. But the advantage of doing it with the law firm is that they can set you up for success. Um, they can really help you design the company so that you can grow and get investment. Um, other things we do, and I'm not going to talk too much about it because I have wonderful Gabrielle next to, next to me. We have grant workshops and um, talking about pre-seed funding, that's usually the first step you do when I mean, you have a really cool project. You will try to get some free money, basically, um, and then go after the investment that takes some equity in your, in your company. So we have the grant workshops. We, I also personally work with a lot of the founders on their first deck. So if you don't know where to start, I'm happy to work with a very rough deck and just kind of polish it up until, until you're comfortable enough to start talking to investors and angels and all of that. Other things we do is seminars. So those are supposed to be informational, but also inspirational. So we try to bring in speakers that will talk about all the different topics, anything from how to build your team to how to market your product, how to deal with the FDA, what are any new regulations that you should be aware of and all of that, including um, IP stuff, immigration law for entrepreneurs, and all sorts of uh, cool topics. Our website is qb3.org. You can just Google us, qb3. Um, besides the seminars, we also have office hours, and I'm just going to pitch them for a second because I think it's a great format to interact with lawyers, consultants, and all sorts of experts without paying. So. You'll see a trend here. Um, we try to get all the resources either heavily discounted or free. And we try to hustle so you guys have a better chance of succeeding. So um, as you grow, we also have um, six incubator locations right now. Um, those are usually packed. Um, that's web lab space for biotech companies, um, some medical devices as well, some diagnostics as well. Um, and if you're interested in that, we can talk about it. Usually that happens in you know, late year one or maybe year two of your company formation. And as you keep growing, we have more services for that as well, including uh, corporate partnerships, 
So introdu introducing you to potential partners or acquirers, and we also have pitch summits where you can compete and get in front of investors, kind of like Shark Tank style. So one by own, one, you go in there, you have the mic for 10 minutes, and that's your shot. Um, and you can make the most out of it. So we do a lot of stuff. I'm happy to talk about any of the, the menu items that I mentioned. And um, just come grab me, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. I want to give a quick shout out to Qubit3 because when Deepak first started Doug Crawford from Qubit Three, he was the one who gave the idea of having food and beer. He sponsored that for a whole year. And ever since then we've been going on that. But thank you. But it's a, it's like again another great resource. I have my own startup. I'm a startup in a box company and I didn't know what I was doing doing as a postdoc. Uh, but they taught me, held my hand to a certain distance and they let me out. Uh, talk to them. Thank you. Um, so thank you, BPEP, for inviting me. I must say I'm honored to share a panel, even though she's still she's not still here. But somebody tell her I gave her this compliment. Caroline Winnett um, actually lives up the street from me. She's one of the first people I met when I moved to Berkeley. Low these 11 years ago, and she is one of the most impressive people I have met in those 10 years. She just is, she's something else. So, um, let's see, I guess I'm giving a pitch on behalf of the U.S. government. Um, <laughs> uh, but really, I, I'm, I'm I'm here to encourage you to take advantage of the U.S. government and get them to use their funds on thing, projects that are worthwhile. And I won't say, can everybody hear me? I'm not really into the microphone so much. Okay, so um, I've been on both sides of the grant process. I was a, okay. I was a PI at Oregon Health Sciences University. I had a lab, I had NIH grants, et cetera. Then I moved and went to work for NIH where I was for 11 years as a program director. So there, like I was on the dark side and I learned all their Byzantine back ways and uh, their dark secrets and the secret handshakes. And then I left to become a freelance consultant science writer and now I'm back on your side, the applicant side. Um, but I can give you insights into government funding processes that can help you a lot. And in tonight's incredibly brief introduction, let's see. Uh, I'm just going to talk about what are these things with the IRS, PPR, why apply for one, what you need to apply, um, how to find a target um, place for your proposal, and then I'll tell you a little more about the so, what are these programs? SBIR is Small Business Innovation Research, STTR is Small Business Technology Transfer. They were created actually, um, they were the brainchild of a National Science Foundation program officer who had business background. And eventually they became, um, initially they were just for NSF, and then eventually they became a congressionally mandated set aside program in which all federal agencies with budgets above a certain amount must contribute a certain percentage of their budget. And this will become key in a second. Okay, so here it says, indeed, must set aside at least 3.2% of their budget. And what this means in practice is that um, SBIRs and STTRs can be easier to get from the government than regular R01 grants. I don't know if you all are familiar with the usual academic route is the R01 mechanism and how competitive it is. And, um, but in fact, because the SBIR program has a set aside and typically get fewer applications, um, they, the, your chances of success with SBIR, STTR are actually better than with R01. And there's a list of agencies that, is this point? Um, oh, yeah. None of the <laughs> oh, yeah, 
Okay. Yeah. 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 And so the, the main ones for health-related, well, you're not all health-related. <coughs> okay. So how much money is involved? Uh, so the first phase is phase one. That's typically six months, and it's not a lot of money. It's 150K to 225K or more. If it's NIH, you have much more wiggle room. Um, funding is typically for six months. You can drag it out to a year if you want. And um, so, yeah, that's not that much money, but it's enough to do some early feasibility testing of your idea. Now, if things work out well for you in phase one, then phase two is where the big, bigger money comes, and that's um, one to 1.5 million or more uh, for. Um, for a period of two years. There is no phase three funding, um, unfortunately. You have to handle that yourself. So to be eligible for the, these awards, um, you can read the things here. A key item is that you must be a legal resident of the United States, i.e. citizen or green card holder. Um, and the rules have loosened up recently, but the company must still be owned by greater than 50% U.S. individuals or majority U.S. owned business concerns. And critically, the PI of an SBIR has to be willing to commit 50% of their employment time or FTE to the company in the event that they get the grant. So, that means you can apply for one of these while you're still working in somebody else's lab, but in the event that the award comes, that you, you have to get serious about your commitment to the company. Why apply for one? It's non-dilutive funding um, with 2.5 billion a year awarded. Uh, SBIR funding for some was funding for some of you know the big heavy hitters now, Genentech, etc. In 2013, which is last year, I have found data for um, QB3 companies alone got over 20 million in SBIR funds. And for many companies, SBIRs and SDTRs are actually their major source of funding for like the first few years of um, their existence. And two local examples are Cirrus which now has gone very big time, and Sylvatica Biotech, which uh, one of the CEOs actually spoke at a panel here a couple years ago. So, <clears throat> oh, so those are the direct reasons, like you get money, um, but there's also positive indirect side effects. For example, when you get this money, there's no interference whatsoever from the federal agencies. You get to do what you want. You don't even have to do what you said you were going to do initially. Um, it helps you get funding from other investors because it's seen as a stamp of approval from your peers, and more specifically, uh, card-carrying academic and, and industry uh, PhD peers who are scientifically, who, you know, sci scientifically rigorously reviewed your application and found that it was good, that it was solid. And then just the process of writing a grant can be incredibly helpful in just thinking through your project ideas. Often many of us walk around with sort of vague ideas about this would be cool, that would be cool. But it's a quite a different matter to sit down and go step by step. How would I actually do this? What, who are the people I would need to get involved? What would be my milestones? And how much money uh, would I actually need to do it? So the difference between SBIR and STTR, um, STTRs have a major university component. Um, uh, they, in fact, the partnering institution must receive at least 30% of the funds. Um, and so, right, they, SDDR requires you to have a university involved 
uh, FBIR, you can still have a university involved if you like, but it's not a requirement. And university involvement, in the case of SBIRs, can take all kinds of forms, consultants, you know, collaborators, uh, not lab space because you, according to university rules, you can't be making business money on their property, but, um, but you can collaborate quite a bit with universities. Um, overview of the application process, I'll, uh, I don't know if you guys want these slides lately, I'm not going to go through all this stuff. I would say the number one most important thing that most people don't realize is that it's very important to contact uh, the program officer at the funding agency you're targeting, NIH, NSF, DOD, to discuss your program, your project ahead of time and throughout the process because your program officer it can be the single most helpful person to getting your project funded. They can wave all kinds of magic wands to get your project funded if it doesn't get like a perfect score. Uh, they can be very good mentors to you during the application process. I'm still friends and you know colleagues with people that I mentored back you know, 15 years ago at NIH. Um, and a lot of people are afraid to call them, like, oh no, they're, you know, they're so powerful or something. But I used to be one of them. You know, the people are me friendly, wanting to help. Sometimes they're very busy, but you can just keep after them. So how long does it take? This is not a fast funding route. Uh, for example, with NIH and NSF, if you get funded on your very first submission, it will be at least six months from the time you submit to the time you get notice of award. If you don't get a, a fundable score the first time, but are able to submit for the very next deadline, then you're looking at nine to 12 months or longer. Um, so the message is get going on this as fast as possible if you want to do it and if you have everything in place, which is not to say that I encourage people to send an application. There's one philosophy among um, uh, investigators that, oh, I'll just throw in a bunch of grants, like throwing mud at a wall and see what sticks and like get reviewer feedback. And that, I think, is a bad strategy because you actually start to develop a bad reputation with the Institute and the study section. So you want to do your best to give your best work. What are your chances of success for NIH um, and DOD for phase one? It's about 15%. Uh, and that number is based, it's not, you actually have more like a 25% of your first application being, so I forget how these do these numbers. The point is, they're tough to get the first time around, but once you get your phase one application, your chances of phase two go up dramatically. Uh, for example, well, any of these numbers is just crazy compared to how the percentiles you need for an NIH grant to be funded. If it's an R, uh, R01, that is, a regular research grant. So then finding the right agency, here are the funding agencies. DOD, as you can imagine, has the biggest share of the party, has the biggest budget. Next, NIH, uh, the others are relatively small. Here's the kind of things they fund. NIH is only biomedical. NSF does science broadly, and they're much more open to innovative science than NIH. At least, uh, they overlap in the biomedical area, and NSF is the more uh, open-minded of the two with regards to biomedical topics. Also, once if you get funding with NIH, they take pride in sort of taking you under their wing and mentoring you through the rest of your career. So once you get in with them, you're part of a, a, a club. DOD um, funds pretty much everything, in part, including all kinds of weird things you can never guess. Um, but they, in their case, they choose all the project topics. So the two different ways you can go is you can either dream up your project idea all by 
by yourself and just submit it. Here's what we want to do. Most NIH grants are that way. All NSF grants are that way. DOD does not uh, go, DOD wants to be the boss of your ideas. So for DOD, you can only go after um, projects, topic areas that they've announced that they're interested in. Um, NIH also has a, a funding opportunity program. NSF does not. And so if you want to look at what kinds of funding opportunities are available, they're often very broad things like um, uh, nano platforms for drug delivery, yeah. nanoparticle platforms. Yeah. yeah. They're pretty broad. I mean, so they're the, the omnibuses, which are pretty even more vague, right? Anyone can omnibuses, buy. whatever yeah. you want. To and do. then they're the most more specific ones, like, oh, we just want the new technology to do this kind of project. And then there are the very specific ones. Um, and the more specific you can, um, like, if you find a grant that's very specific, then your chances of getting it are higher because there are not that many people who do that. And if you're one of them, you're maybe one out of two or three people who can actually fulfill that. So, yeah. So it's always a good idea to look for these targeted. And there's the searchable sites you can go. And just to, to show you DOD, I mean, I personally feel a little weird dealing with DOD. I'm a bleeding heart, liberal, peace, and a hippie. But in fact, some of their topics, I don't know if you can see the slide that well, are very sort of military, like gunner, primary site, GPS, shock, isolator, whatever that is. But then some of them um, are very broad, like 360 degree field of info view information uh, and a 120 degree immersive reality display. So for example, the virtual reality people have had a heyday with uh, DOD funding. So, so do go in and look at those topic areas and you may be surprised. And then finally, this um, website is a gold mine of information. Um, there's a site, it's searchable, you can go in and find all SBIRs and STTRs and all other grants that have ever been funded by federal agencies. And you can, that'll help you target the funding agency you want to go to. Um, you can check out the competition. You can see who you know in your field, um, or you don't even know them ahead of time. You can just plug in keywords related to your topic and see who's gotten funded in that, those areas, how much money they got, how long it's for, who was their program director, et cetera, et cetera. And you can even use their abstracts to inspire your own thinking. Um, <laughs> And writing about what you know constitutes a good specific game, etc. And then my last point is: so this all sounds super good, but often people call me saying, "I have this really great idea for new technology to do. I don't know. I want to do an app that will like follow." Uh, Glycemic index of foods you eat and be, you know, paired to something that will give you alerts and da da da. Um, so that's a great idea, but what they, when I press harder, it often turns out that they don't really have the expertise on their team. Like, you need a clinical, like, something with an MD, PhD in nutrition to, like, help you <laughs> with this if you yourself are an engineer. Um, so it's critical to have on board the team you need. You can't tell the granting agency, well, we'll figure this out later. You have to be very specific and have everybody signed up ahead of time. A well-defined set of research goals. These grants are not to just like fund your company or fund you or fund your general, you know, cool idea. It's to fund a very specific project that takes place in that specific time and can be paid for with a specific amount of money. And then finally, um, the best scientific ideas go into the 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 junk what's the word junk pile 
from a viewer's junk pile if they're not well written. So these last three items are called grantsmanship, and that is clear, impactful writing, uh, have your proposal nicely packaged with graphics, etc., so it's very user friendly. And then finally, understanding how to navigate the kind of system, like who to call, at what point, and how you can help them. And that's what we teach in our QB3 workshops. They're offered two a year. There's one at UCB taught by me, one at UCSF taught by Shauna Farm or Jones. You can still go to, if you sign up for one, you can yeah, still go it, it might It might be a, a lot a lot of time commitment if you do Well, you probably wouldn't want to do all the lectures yeah. in both. But like basically, if you miss a, a session or something like that, you can try to get to catch up. Yeah, our focus is sort of different. Shauna focuses a lot on the actual mechanics of, I mean, she gets in there with you hands on and helps you like jam that submission <laughs> through the, <Yeah. laughs> through the uh, submission system. She knows the answers to all like the most arcane questions about which boxes to check, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not so much of a paperwork type. I'm my background is the scientific first, and then writing second. So I'm much more about, you know, the grantsmanship side, um, how to work the the system, um, who to talk to, um, uh, basically, yeah, how to write well, that kind of thing. Um, although I also cover the mechanics. So there's when the next classes start. And then in our workshop, this is what we cover. The mechanics of the plan, developing the overall project idea, finding a home for your project, how to talk to program officers, how to woo them, make them love you and want to pay you, grantsmanship, and then finally, a, a most helpful feature for a lot of people is you actually can bring in your specific aims to class and I and Joanna will both and your fellow students will review them for you and give you feedback which for many people has turned out to be uh, extremely useful. So that's that. There's me. Um, that's SBR in a nutshell. Good. That's great. I think you know. I think the nut, yeah, nutshell, the takeaway for you guys is SBIR, STPR is free money. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way of making it more interesting. It sounds boring, but then it's free money. There won't be an angel investor or a venture capitalist hanging your head. Okay. So, so make sure you apply for grants. Uh, we'll open this up for questions. Maybe a good format might be if a couple of you have any ideas to start a company. Maybe you can stand up talk about it for a second, maybe Cyclotron Road and QB3 can tell you what you're a good fit for, or you can ask any questions. Anybody, don't feel shy, it's all postdocs. Anybody who wants to start a company? Yeah, come on. All right, yes. so my name is Paul. I'm trying to start a uh, prostate cancer immunotherapy company, and uh, this is in line with uh, Professor Michael Karen down at UC San Diego. And he identified the target, and I'm working with him to develop an antibody therapeutic against that target. And uh, I think Skydag would be a good fit for me, potentially, and potentially even the Citrus Foundry through QB3. I can actually hear that mentioned today. And um, any other suggestions you may have? I'm not actually physically doing this on the campus. Okay. Uh, well, I, I can take that. Um, just to clarify, so Citrus is another great resource on campus and we're sister institutes, so they're focusing on the big societal, like society problems, including energy and uh, including biotech and some other areas, and we're specific for life sciences. So yes, QB3 can help in that aspect, uh, we can help incorporate, we can also figure out like where you are, what, where you want to be. And um, you can think of it more like a consultant. You come in with your problem, you explain what the problem is, and based on our experience, what else we've seen and what we know about um, other entities around, we can custom make a package of information for you. And as I mentioned, I work with a lot of people on putting together the, the message. And 
translating the science into something that people can get excited about, really simplifying it, and explaining what the product is. Because you can go on and on about the science and the receptors and the target and all of that, but you know you can boil down something to a product. As you said, it's an antibody, you have the indication, so it seems like it's a pretty clear-cut uh, project, so we would love to help. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Paulo. I'm from Brazil, and uh, I'm a visiting scholar here. And I've been working my master's there with a uh, water purifying reactor. So we, we basically we do like water disinfection and remove the pollutants from the water. Like you have hormones, pesticides in the drinking water, so we try to get rid of those. And uh, right now I'm doing the market research to try to fix the market. So I'm I'm actually very uh, skeptical about. Why? Because I don't. I know that I need that market research. So, is it still like a possibility to, to be applied? Or, yeah. That's, that's basically. It sounds like you're at the perfect stage. The program really helps you learn how to do that. People come in a whole range. Some people have been professors their whole life and decide. Some people are coming straight out of postdoc and decide to join the program. But when it comes to technology, um, early stage is great. Like that's the idea of the program is to be able to pivot. So we want people to have the freedom to figure out what their market should be before locking down an investor that says you're going this way. So we help you with that process. So I think you should apply and have a good talk to you about it. Thank you. How many of you have a bio background? Computer science, engineering. It's a good mix, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, Berkeley, about 60 to 70 percent of the postdocs are life sciences. Brenna, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Cyclotron is fantastic. I don't think you take too many bio-based startup companies. Yes. Yeah, so how do they approach Cyclotron Road? Like, are you open to other startup companies other than energy, advanced manufacturing, and so on? What's what's the take on that? Sure, we take a couple of biology companies every year. So, and one was actually in QB3 before, and then hopped over to Cyclotron Road. So, we all work very collaboratively, <coughs> which makes it potentially a little confusing for all of you. But the good news is that there's no wrong answer, and potentially just try all of us. And, <laughs> and then we can help you figure out where you fit best. Uh, but specifically on the bio side, when it comes to like a new molecule that is specific for a like a very biomedical target, it's a bit hard to fit that into what our sponsors count as impact in their areas of interest. Um, but if there's some sort of technology that has a broader application, could potentially lead to a savings of energy. So for example, if you have a new way of screening for these molecules and it is a lot faster and cheaper, that definitely falls in our purview, even though you're applying it to biology, that's totally fine. So um, in the end, it's sort of about like the broader impact. If it can be tied back to energy, tied back to electronics, then it definitely fits. Hi. Uh, I'm not going to stand up. My name's Armand. I'm, I'm not a postdoc. I'm an MBA, but I have a startup. And we are working on uh, applying machine learning technologies to pharmacogenomic data to enable personalized medicine. My research team is based in Poland, uh, and I recognize that I would probably need a PI uh, here, and I, I just need support from QB. I don't, I don't know how I could get support from QB3 to uh, maintain the research in Poland and, and kind of uh, leverage the resources that are at Berkeley and, and the Bay Area. Uh, to establish a good platform and, and turn it into business. Okay. Um, well, so one thing I forgot to mention, we do work with companies um, across California. We can't expand too much outside because we are funded by the state of California and our mission is to stay local. Mm -hmm. But you're here, so I think we can work with that. Um, what really helps me is to understand what the parameters of the situation are. So working with the deck is usually a good idea because you have all the information there, who's involved, what, what you need, what you're planning to do in the future. When it comes to introductions to professors or investors or mentors or stuff like that, we get that all the time, uh, the, the requests. And what we try to do is to get to know the team a little bit better, what they need, um, if they have a list of people they would want to work with, 
maybe we know some of them, maybe we don't. But um, we're in the people business, so we we like to also coach our, our founders and all of that, but uh, be careful about who we introduce to whom. So making sure that there's a good fit, um, even when we reach out to the professor, let's say, we have a little blurb that we can say, this company is really cool, they're doing this thing, and this is what they want your, um, your insight because you're doing this really cool thing. So having that research to back up the email contact usually is a lot more efficient. And that's why I say that um, it's good to get to know the team, what they need, what the, the, the story is all about. And then I work with a lot of teams, again, at kind of the message. How do you explain what you're doing in a way that people get excited about and they want to help you? And the good news is actually a lot of people want to help. Like I've been reaching out to a lot of people and I've been surprised about the, the percentage of yeses. But it's all about how you reach out to them, being respectful and being also a little bit kiss ass, sorry, that usually helps. But um, you know, just making sure you get them excited and they want to mentor you and, and help you out. So we can talk afterwards. Okay, thanks. Okay. Probably I can pose a question for QB3. A couple of questions. One is like if somebody's trying to start a company, if they're still a grad student or a postdoc, what is the timeline? What is a good time to start incorporate that company? Yeah. When, when should they start? And probably from the grant perspective, what are the timelines they should keep in mind? Because grants take time to come in. So when should they leave their postdoc position? Uh, you know, I think Cyclotron Road, it's a full-time thing, so they need to leave that uh, postdoc position. But with QB3 and startups, uh, I don't think you have to leave your positions. If you can explain that, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, each case is unique, so that's the disclaimer. But um, besides that, I don't know about you, but when I was in grad school, I didn't have any savings. So I like to be pretty conservative about people leaving their day job to jump into a startup. So y you can incorporate the startup, but leaving your day job, either as a scientist or as a grad student or as a postdoc, is, is a risky business. So I usually recommend jumping ship once you have some other boat to jump into. Um, so you need to incorporate when you're starting to negotiate about licenses. So there needs to be another entity that can discuss with the, uh, with the university about getting that patent. So that's one trigger. Another trigger is when you start applying for grants, and I'll pass it over to Gabriel in a second. And then the third trigger is usually when you have an investor ready to write a check, and they just need to know who should they write it to. They cannot write it to you as a person. So it's usually um, an angel. Maybe if you're really lucky and your PI is super famous, you'll get a VC knocking on your door being like, hey, I have $10 million for you. Just open the door. Um, it doesn't happen all the time. Um, but what can you do in the meantime, right? So definitely apply for grants. Have a very, very good plan of what you want to do. Be very realistic about the cost and the timeline. And it won't be right. Like, don't even try to, to get it right because it won't be right. But you need to have a plan. If you're just jumping into a black hole and you don't know what's on the other side, that's usually not safe. It's not something we would recommend. So you can keep a day job and start planning for that startup and start building the pieces. And the pieces are usually the team, a really good plan about how to develop the product, and even a list of who you want to get on board, who you want to get as an investment. And you know, I get that question all the time, but let's say, how do you find VCs that will invest in you or something like that? There's a lot of research, a lot of detective work that needs to be done, finding a company similar to yours, seeing you know, who invested in them, and all that information is online. So, Doing all that research work for your startup and putting all these pieces together before you jump ship and quit your day job, that's what I would recommend. But maybe I'm too conservative. Maybe the hunger makes you move faster. Now, that's another thing. So imagine you work on this idea, on this concept, one hour a week. You will you'll move forward, but you'll, you'll go pretty slow. Now, imagine you're going 40 hours a week. Obviously, you're going much faster, right? But there must be a balance between paying the bills and moving really fast. So I'm not going to tell you what the, the secret is. That, that's something you guys have to decide. But definitely building a team that will hold each other responsible and keep moving forward and not just stay in this limbo of, 
oh, let's, let's meet once every other week for coffee and talk about this cool idea, but actually have a plan to move forward and keep moving forward. I think that that's, that's good for the first few months. And then once you have that plan of who are you gonna, whose door are you gonna knock on, then maybe consider you know working on the full time. So that's more about quitting your day job. The incorporation can happen, as I mentioned, um, when you have a trigger. Okay, Gabrielle. Um, so the good thing about federal funding is you don't actually have to leave your day job until you get the notice of a grant award. That having been said, the phase one grant is only 150 to 225k. So depending on what area you're in, if you're doing something like that's very computer based and doesn't require a lot of equipment, you can use all that money for salaries and. So maybe that would be fine for you. If you're doing something biological that requires like transgenic vice and stuff, you, you know, there's not gonna be much money left over for your salary. So um, I agree with Joanna that um, before you sit down to write a grant, you, you really have to get practical about what, what specific things would I accomplish in the six month period with this amount of money? Can I actually afford to accomplish those things with that amount of money? And then the other sticker is, um, it's good to have preliminary res data before you apply for um, an SBIR. It's, it really will increase your chances of getting funding. So to the extent that you can start collecting that data, you know, in the lab where you're employed or your garage or wherever, that's another thing to start um, working on ahead of You want to get your, your ducks, in ducks in a row, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's a very good point with SBIRs and STDRs. When you look at the application form, they say you don't need any data, but the, the but secret yes. is that's you a lie. a lot of data. <laughs> they lie. The more data you have, the better the chance of getting you're grant funded, make sure you have all the data before you leave the lab, if, if your startup is based on that startup company, on that research. Uh, you want to brought up a good point, like, like scientists, entrepreneurs are very optimistic, I think. When we come into the start, lab to start a research, we think it's going to work. <laughs> all the time, we never think about that negative side. Uh, I think one of these days we want to do a day-long workshop, if you can bring your work ideas, think about all, all the negative sides and positive sides. What are the options of your, where your startup could go? Uh, we'll keep you posted about that workshop soon, but I think it's a good exercise. You know, everybody has ideas, but you'll be successful if you can think through the positives and negatives. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, make, you, know, you can just go home and do that, start doing that. But any more questions? If not, uh, a big round of applause to the speakers. Beer and the speakers are going to hang out for some more time. Please network, get more information. They're here for you guys. Thank you for coming. <laughs>